Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me this year, this afternoon here, and it is my pleasure to present this uh, information to you, and hopefully that uh, you will gain something out of it there. I will disclose, when we get into physical therapy and we look at exercise and we look at movement, it is not a one-size-fits-all situation. So I ask you to take that in mind as we kind of go through this this afternoon. When we look at these recommendations and guidelines, that's exactly what they are. They are recommendations. They are guidelines. They are not written in stone. They are not presented as a end-all, be-all, but more as a starting point to start helping people get some better information, to help them start managing disease and pathology in the realm of movement and what we consider restoring optimal health. So with that, part of that is where I come into this confusion on where to start here because there's usually an evolutionary process when we look at disease and pathology for most individuals and how they move and what they do. And sometimes there's certain diseases and pathologies that are very much newer to medicine, that there's not a lot of information out there. There's not a lot of people working with these things. So as we get there, there is a natural evolution there. So I put this up there kind of as a tongue in cheek when we take a look at this, whereas if you go into the research literature taking a look at ankylosing spondylitis, you might be down more on the latter end of the beginning scale versus where if you looked at ACL protocols in athletes, you might be at the burger size end of the scale of things. And that's unfortunately what we have with some of this research that we present is we have that disparity in information and education. But hopefully with some of this, we'll be able to close some of the gaps for you as we present some of this information so that we can show you what's going on. So one of the things we will always take a look back is take a look at what the early approaches were, what kind of happens to this information as people present and try to disseminate through this information. So some of the earliest stuff we look at is 1978 in the British Medical Journal where they were saying, talking about an active approach. They never really defined it, but they were just talking about being active. And they also talked about the ideas of changing certain habits and behaviors. One of my favorites in there is the adjustable mirror to the bed for better viewing in case you have a pet or something of that nature looking for floor obstacles. And then of course, as only the British can do it, the car bonnet of having the um, convex mirror on it there to again improve visual range as if someone has lost cervical range of motion and does not have the full field but still can drive and still can function out in society. So these are some early adaptations and measures that were thrown around from uh, the British version of movement. As we've continued into the journey, we've talked about the idea of maintaining and improving spinal mobility and peripheral joints strengthening the abdominal muscles, the back muscles, the leg. And we can achieve this by both a supervised program and unsupervised program. But again, trying to give the individual a better starting point there and just also exercise groups by individuals as well. One of the earliest things that came out was, and this has been for ankylosing spondylitis, is that there has been positive effects of exercise in non-severe ankylosing spondylitis, especially in the short term, have been demonstrated by randomized clinical control trials. This is back in 2004, okay? And if you notice Bath UK, now you understand where the Bath scale comes from. So, so now what? Well, we generally come to a conclusion that if we keep moving, keep people moving, excuse me, they naturally do better, which is true. As human beings, we are designed to move. We're designed to be active. We're not designed to, unfortunately for you, sit behind chairs and presentations and listen to people speak all day. We're designed to be outside, walking around, enjoying the sunshine, even if it is cold, okay? So the idea is that, what are we looking for? We're looking for range of motion. We're looking for aerobic, we're looking for strengthening, and we're looking for balance. These are the big components of just any kind of generalized exercise program that should be out there. And it can be achieved in different ways. So when we come to the idea of this consensus, we were lucky enough this year that there was actually a consensus published. And this is brand new, and it just talks about a consensus statement. So what they did is they did a Delphi project, which is a big fancy term, was they took all the research they could get their hands on, and they started funneling it down and seeing what research met their criterion of value and then maybe showed the best value for individuals that's out there. And again, it is a consensus statement. It is not a 
individualistic treatment program. Now, out of that, they came out with 10 recommendations in there. The assessment, monitoring, safety, disease management, ankylosing spondylitis specific exercise, i.e. mobility, and then we have the same with other, physical activity, dosage, adherence, and exercise setting. Some of these are divided up as far as more physical therapy basic, i.e. the mobility, other physical activity, and dosage, and then obviously looking for disease management more into the rheumatological realm. When you have chronic pathologies like this, I like to use the idea of think of an umbrella. You never have a good working one-spoked umbrella. There are multiple providers for pathologies like this in order to make the umbrella work. So for people that have either ankylosing spondylitis or on the other end of the spectrum, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which would be the hypermobility connective tissue, there is usually rheumatologists, cardiologists, physical therapists, primary care physicians, the patient themselves, all these things have to work together for the patient and for them to optimize their ability. So one of the biggest things that we always get into with physical therapy is trying to educate the individual and educate the patient and sometimes spouse, family, other care providers there as to what are the changes that happen as we move along. Now, I have one of my favorite friends here. This is Fred. This stands for flexion, rotation, extension, device. So he flexes, he extends, he rotates. And if you notice, if we get flexion and rotation, we create something called side bending. So all of that works together. Now the nice part about Fred is that when we can see something move, sometimes it helps us kind of visualize a little bit better on what's going on. Now, so we've just had lunch. So everyone, please stand up. This is an interactive portion of your day. This is just the, where the, your glycemic index from that cake is setting in, right? We've got to move here just a little bit. So what do we want to do? We're going to flex a little bit. Everyone just kind of flex nice and easy. Move a little bit. We're going to come up. We're going to turn either to the left or right. You can mirror me. You can go the opposite way. You can come the other way, come back. And then just think about getting a little extension, lifting your sternum to the ceiling and moving. There you go, and now sit back down. Congratulations, you all moved. There we go. Congratulations. Now, as I was looking around at you all doing this, we obviously have some different variations in the availability of movements. So that's what we're going to get into right now. So. When we look at this, we're looking at the functional and postural aspects are one of the biggest things that we see in the changes of the individual with movement, okay? The main manifestation is decreased mobility. And us as physical therapists, the big thing we're always trying to get people to do is move in any way we can. Now, the problem is, is that if we start losing the ability to move, we start seeing this kind of sequelae of events coming down the pike here as to what starts happening down the body. So we start losing mobility, we start loading abnormally. It puts more stress and load on different junctions. Those changes start changing how we move in the spine, in the lower limbs, and starts loading the muscles differently. If you remember anything about today, motion is lotion. That's the key. That's the phrase that pays. Motion is lotion. The better movement you have, the better you move, the better you feel, okay? Now, when we don't move, we get down here, we start getting into inflammatory changes, early degeneration, and increased abnormal high loads, okay? And these start creating some of these arthritic changes that we see, not only in just disease pathology as in ankylosing spondylitis, but also normal people with osteoarthritis we start seeing some of these degenerative changes. Some of these degenerative changes are normal, okay? I know I woke up this morning because you saw my face in the um, little pamphlet that went out. I was a much younger man this morning, and I woke up and I'm here. I turned gray from driving in Atlanta traffic. <laughs> Whew, good Lord, but and one thing that's all happened is, I don't know about you, but I move exactly the same way I did when I was 20, which was earlier this morning. No, not one of us do that. So when we start putting it all together, 
when we start seeing what we look at, what we call normal posture, and again, there's some variations in there, make no mistake about it. And then we start taking a look at some of the changes with someone with ankylosing spondylitis. We can start seeing some of these changes in line, in gravity, in position, in support. So when we start doing that, the way we load against gravity is different. The way we take force against gravity is different. And that puts excessive load on the body. Now, we're gonna start here in the lumbar spine. Now, why the lumbar spine? Because most of the time in most radiographic evidence, when we take a look at movement, first thing that we normally see is fusion of what? Say it loud, say it proud. Everybody knows it. SI, sacroiliac joint, right? Okay. Now, if we take a look at normal development, when every one of us is born, this is your spine when you're born. That's how you come out. Then, as you start becoming a baby, you're here. And what's the first thing these babies do? Lift their head and rotate. Start getting head control. That starts changing the cervical spine. That starts giving the cervical curve. Then, they start doing what? Standing up. What starts happening now? Lumbar curve. So you still have your primary curve of your thoracic and your sacrum, but you have your secondary curves of lumbar and cervical. Well, all of a sudden, and what's the third thing they do? Never stop talking. <laughs> never stop talking. I have an eight-year-old, she never stops talking. So, now, but when that SI fuses, because it can't flex, it becomes a stiff rod. Can we all see that? Hopefully there's some light bulbs going off right now that we can actually see that. So, we start seeing some of these posterior changes. Posterior sacrum. Well, what's the spine up top gonna do? It can't stay like this if this is like this, because it's gonna try to balance out gravity. So it's slowly gonna start doing this. All of a sudden, the thoracic's gonna be there. So all of a sudden, we're gonna start seeing this flattening of the lordotic curve. So, compensatory posture, decreased elasticity of the anterior ligament right here in the front, because normally it's here. Now it's here. So, I put up here, and hopefully all of you have dialed in on it. Examples of treatment, there says careful manipulation with an asterisk. Hopefully everyone just honed in on that and went, oh my God. Good, we'll get to that in a second. We wanna stretch the taut muscles. We wanna work some strengthening, we wanna work some postural tra training, and work some mobility exercises. These are all things that we want to do to try to keep as much mobility in the lumbar spine as possible. Now, one of the things with ankylosing spondylitis is, is that when the spine fuses, it does not move like normal spine mechanics do. That's normal, that's what happens under pathology. So we use the term careful manipulation in this as more of an idea of treatment for people that are more in the early stages than in the later stages. Because the idea being here is that that's what we think of manipulation, right? For those of you who didn't see, we will play it again. That is not what manipulation is, okay? I will guarantee you that is not manipulation. What joint manipulation is, is a coverall term. It is sometimes used interchangeably with mobilization. And it depends on where in the world you are, who you were trained by, who uses it interchangeably, and what techniques there are. There is a variety of different techniques that are out there that are not what we consider in normal things when people think of manipulation as high velocity thrust techniques. It is a way of doing it, but it is not the only thing out there. And I can tell you that most people know anybody with AS and it's been there and we can see uh, changes on there, no one will put a thrust to your spine in their right mind, okay? If they try to do it, they're not in their right mind, get out of there immediately. Now, but I throw that out there just so you can see and you can understand is that 
there is an availability to try to maintain mo mobility into the spine itself, into the joints, even the extremities themselves. They still follow these same rules, okay? But once, unfortunately, you get to fusion, we're not gonna be mobilizing anything because you cannot mobilize a fused joint, okay? It just doesn't happen. That's where you try to work with other modalities and things of that nature, and we'll talk about some things down the road here. Now, let's get into the thoracic spine, into the thoracic column here. This is one of the primary curves that stay under our normal evolution. But in here, we start noticing some decreased mobility of anterior force, especially there may be an increase in the kyphosis. So we start seeing an increase in the general curve. There should, in a normal curve, be a kyphosis. That's what's there. That's normal. That's what we should have. But as we said before, we have the flattening of the spine. We change this, we start changing the angle, we start changing the shape of the kyphosis. That becomes more here, and all of a sudden we start getting that head forward. Now we can start kind of figuring out why necks hurt because that's there. And for people that don't have AS, that just walk around like this looking at their cell phones all day, you can call that text neck. So, but a lot of this you will see in the front itself. You will see a shortening of the pectoralis muscles. You will see decreased flexion into the glenohumeral joints, and you will see a decrease in the expansion of the chest. Here comes the fun part, okay? I want everyone to stand up again, because I told you this was interactive. You will be doing this all day, so if you haven't gotten your squats in yet, you're going to get them in now, okay? So, now, so everyone slouch forward, good. Now, bring your arms up as high as you can. There we go, it's hard to bring them up, isn't it? Now extend through the spine and bring your arms up. Hey, look at where they went to. It is hard to get up there because that is a mechanical change that if the spine is forward, the shoulder blades go forward, the arms can't go up as high. And that is part of just those structural changes. Please be seated. Now, here comes the fun one too. All right, this one you'll do seated. All right, everyone, just sit back in your chair. Let your arms hang by your side as best you can. Take a nice deep breath in. Feel your sternum lift to the wall, out to the world, and come back. Ah, Now, roll in again. Try to take that same deep breath in. Much harder. Much harder to do because there is less space in there. As we take a look at the ribs and we take a look at the thoracic spine, Normally your ribs are here with a little declination, but as we go rounding more into that kyphosis, what happens? They become more angled. So normally when we inhale, we breathe in, the ribs come up to about horizontal level to allow air to come in. But if I'm flexed forward, they do not have the expansion capacity to reach horizontal. So now you're working harder against gravity. And that's where people will start using their neck muscles and accessory muscles more, okay? And this is why we put at the end here, we talk about, you know, it can mimic cardiac symptoms here. If someone does not have enough front to back, we call that an AP measure, where that the sternum is actually encroaching into the cardiac space. And that is obviously something via radiographic there and of a more extreme situation, especially if someone's got a deformity of the pectoralis muscle or some kind of other, um, what we consider, um, I don't want to say abnormal, but um, abnormal is probably the best word, of a decrease of that sternal space between the ribs that they just don't have. So how do we work this? We facilitate the mobility of the thoracic spine. Breathing exercises are big. We strengthen the posterior muscles. Work on that shoulder blade positioning as we all just talked about. And of course, i.e. careful manipulation in here and even into the ribs if necessary, if tolerable, because the ribs are supposed to be mobile. That's their job. If you like to breathe, you need mobile ribs. If you want to breathe harder, your ribs aren't mobile, it's gonna be a lot harder. Now, the cervical spine. We just talked about that before. We talked about that forward head bending, right? We talked about the text neck. We talked about decreased mobility. Here comes another fun one, right? Everybody's sitting nice and tall. 
as best you can, turn your head to the left, turn your head to the right. Doesn't matter which way you want to choose. Okay, allow yourself to slouch forward. Now try to turn your head left and right. All of a sudden you just lost a lot of room, didn't you? Exactly, because your head sits on a pivot. Think of your head as a bowling ball sitting on a pool cue, because that's basically what it is. If we take a look at the spine, notice it gets thicker at the bottom, thinner at the top, and you have that giant bowling ball head on the top there. 50% of your rotation comes from these two joints right here, C1, C2. Everything else is a cascade all the way down. So you start limiting mobility in here, you're gonna start limiting external mobility as far as function. Now, and then obviously we're gonna have increased muscle pain, neck tension, potentially headaches, ocular pain. Um, sometimes people will have increased jaw pain with it, along with that. So these are not abnormal symptoms, they're normal because again, if the body's not loading normally, we're gonna find a way to move, we're gonna find a way to adapt. So, lower limbs. Obviously when we showed you the earlier picture, the first thing that happens as soon as your pelvis goes back is you start flexing through the hips and the knees because you can't get full extension because of the loss of the lordosis. So that's why you increase the flexion in through the hips and the knees. So then that's gonna to lead to the tight and weakness within the hams, the quads, the glute, and the hip flexors there. So this is a problem because when you lose that, you start losing normal balance and the ability. And you will see people starting to shuffle when they walk because they don't have the range of motion to do so. It becomes harder to maintain that balance. You will also see people shorten their step and decrease their stride length and narrow it. And sometimes that narrowing is actually more unsafe because it loses the balance even more. So this is one of the things here where when we lose this extension, we alter the walking mechanics and it becomes harder to move. It is a harder movement. So let's try this. Everybody stand up. We're going to walk around the room here. Everybody just stand up nice and tall. Just walk around. Take a few steps around where you're at there. There you go. Here comes the topping of the cake, right? Here we go, just walking around the room there. Now, stop wherever you're at, let your knees bend, let your hips bend so you're almost feeling like you're doing a little squat. Now keep that and walk. Uh-oh, that just became a lot harder. That's a lot more load in through the legs. So, you don't have to keep doing that, you can return to your seats, but we have you on camera so it's funny for all of us. So, and then we start seeing these muscular changes because now all of a sudden things are having to work harder. We see loss of strength, shortening of these muscles, structural changes, decreased energy production, and if you're not feeling well, guess what you're not gonna wanna do? You're not gonna wanna move. You're not gonna wanna do things because why? It hurts. It does not feel good. So that becomes that perpetual pain, spasm, pain cycle that you get locked into. And that does not help your condition. That does not help your independence. That does not help your ability to function in the world at all. So, now, what I've showed you with the biomechanical changes is a variety of potential things that are out there. Unfortunately, with ankylosing spondylitis is that not everybody's gonna achieve the same distance of inability. Not everybody's gonna achieve the same levels of fusion. There's gonna be variability that's there. So when we do the part of this presentation, when we're looking at the biomechanical changes, we're looking at obviously some of the more severe limitations that are out there. And unfortunately, some people will progress to that. Unfortunately, there's no prognostication from the physical therapy world that tells us which one, who's gonna to get to where. We don't know. So we're always just trying to take the individual from where they're at to where we would like them to be, 
or to what they have and try to maintain what they have and arrest any further deterioration or loss of mobility to the best of our ability. So what kind of a treatments are, are appropriate is always the great question here. And unfortunately, I was trying to get this to work because what would have been really funny is when he cracks his shoulder like that, his leg sticks out. Unfortunately, that did not work. And I was very disappointed by that. But, so, when I'm going through this list now, these are different things from physical therapy, from what we look at, from different treatments that are out there, okay? And it's a pretty comprehensive list. I'm sure there's one or two things that I don't have in here. But again, to try to give you as global of an idea of things that are out there, this is what we've got here. So first thing we look at is manual therapy. And the reason why I put that first, because that is my bias. That's what I do for a living. So of course I'm going to put that first. Why wouldn't I? That would be ridiculous not to. So when we look at manual therapy, we look at any kind of hands-on treatment. Okay? This includes, but not limited to, myofascial manipulation of different things to get into the musculature or into the soft tissue, i.e. joint manipulation as we talked about earlier with the same kind of limitations that we talked about earlier when we looked at the fusion of the joint and movement and we still include mobilization under this header. And then the problem we have though is that there is no randomized clinical trials evaluating the efficacy. There's just not there. In ankylosing spondylitis, there are some in people without certain pathologies because it is easier to study and it's easier to grab a cohort for people that need to publish to keep tenure. So a lot of times we're stuck with those individuals there. So, but also the problem is manual, ther manual therapy is never used in isolation. It is used in the collaboration of treatment. It is used as part of the whole. And obviously depending on who you see, where they've trained, what they do, there will be a little bit of variation into that too. But it can help with movement, it can help with restoration of ability of joint if the joint has the ability to move. And again, this is very highly variable to the individual, where they're at in the disease pathology, and to which joints are fused and which joints aren't. So, Electrophysical agents and thermotherapies, okay? All of these things are used to reduce muscle pain, facilitate joint motion prior to exercise. Not limited to, but some of the things that are out there that you may have seen or heard of, diathermy, ultrasound, a TENS unit, low level laser therapy, hot packs would be even be included in here as far as movement there. But again, there's nothing evaluating the efficacy and whether or not these do. Most of the time though, I can tell you from a practical point of view, anecdotal, is that when we use these thermal modalities, because we're inducing heat into the area, most people work better. Okay? So again, but also it's never used alone. So it may help though, increase the tolerance for activity. It may help with the individual's tolerance for that. Hydrotherapy or bulimiotherapy, i.e. spa therapy as well. This is exercising in heated water, uh, water aerobics type of program, things like that there. Um, you'll look over there again when you look at some of the literature into our European cousins there, the passive bathing in thermal mineral water. Yes, we have lots of mineral bathing facilities here in Atlanta, counting zero that um, you will not find here in the United States. But again, if after this talk you're like, you know what, that inspired me to go overseas and travel, and I wanna hit the various spas of the UK, feel free. So, but again, it is very much high cost, has a limited accessibility, um, and for the long term, it's not proven better than just exercise alone there, but it's one of those things there that do we move better because of the buoyancy in the water than we do against gravity? The answer is yes, we do. So there is a value in doing water therapy for people that may have bigger movement limitations because they can do more movement in the water with less load on gravity and may opt to work a little bit better. Let's get to the root of everything here. Exercise, this is our bread and butter. 
especially from a physical therapy point of view. This is the plausible long-term benefits list. Again, maybe not inclusive, but it's the idea of, I said before, if you walk away with anything here today, besides a headache after I'm done talking, motion is lotion. Motion is lotion. If we move, it begets movement, it creates movement, it doesn't have to be big, it just has to start somewhere. Okay? So this list is, again, not inclusive, but the idea being, if we create motion, we get motion. Now, the problem with exercise, and this is where we get into, is that when we prescribe exercise, General guidelines do not represent pathology of an individual in their current course. There is not a one size fits all. And if I don't know if you remember, we talked about that consensus earlier. It will say in there, it's not one size fits all. It is a treatment of guidelines to help us recommend a course of action based on the ability of the individual and based upon what they can do and what they can't do. And how do we modify that in between there? And there's a lot of latitude in there. Make no mistake about it. So, but if you look on the bottom here, posture, mobility, respiratory function should be addressed with each program and in daily life. That's the big point. Now, recommendations. Again, generally, if you look here, this is um, by less than 15 years of being diagnosed with AS or greater than 15 years of AS diagnostics, okay? Where they're saying that if you've been diagnosed under 15 years, recreational exercises, but not back exercises, improve pain, stiffness, and function. So being out there, being active, being moving is one of the best things you could do. Now, if you have greater than 15 years, back exercises, not recreational, improve pain and function. Because the idea being is that for more people, as they've gotten further along with the disease pathology, have probably lost a little bit more motion. Now again, that is a very general statement. It is not specific, but it's something that we have to be aware of when we make these recommendations. So, as there, we say moderate exercise helps decrease, decrease disease activity and improve function. Obviously, when we get into more intense exercise, improve function, but not the disease activity, okay? So the home run here is consistency is more important than the quantity. Doing a little bit every day, being consistent. That is the best thing you can do for yourselves. So, again, another exercise consensus, and this is back in 2000, prior to the one that just came out, talked about, we're looking at a minimum of 200 minutes per week of activity, about 30 minutes a day, avoiding prolonged flexion, obviously, because we don't want to encourage some of those pathomechanics and biomechanical changes that we've talked about earlier, and we want to encourage extension and rotation, getting upright, get those back muscles up there. And obviously, there's not going to be, you know, playing volleyball, basketball, squash, swimming, depending on the availability of motion in the individual. But if we've got a younger individual with AS, would we want to encourage them to be as active as possible with these activities? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? And if you're 86 years old and got AS and can still bike, spike a volleyball, please keep spiking a volleyball. Okay? You want to keep that motion as much as you can. Now, as we get with the later stages, there's recommendations of general strengthening exercises one to three times per week and back extension exercises that can be performed twice a day, minimum five days per week. Because again, consistency, consistency, consistency. Mobility. When we define mobility, it is the demand for maximal range of motion for the area being mobilized. And by mobilized, I'm not talking from a therapist's point of view, mobilizing a joint, I'm talking about movement, the idea of the person moving through a range of motion to do something, being able to reach up into a cabinet, making sure that they've got mobility into the shoulder to do something like that, okay? So what we want to have here is free swinging of the trunk and limbs, 
working rotation of the neck, flexion, extension, and rotation of the spine, little pelvic tilting if available, flexion, extension, rotation of the hip, and knee and ankle movements. Again, it's just general movement stuff here. Just like the first thing I had you all do was what? Stand up, flex down, extend, rotate. It can be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be any monumental thing. It can be simple. With mobility, we look for flexibility. Trying to keep the ability of the target areas that get short and tight to move a little bit. One of the big ones, obviously, is the shortened neck muscles, the pelvic muscles. Looking into those hip flexors, looking into those hamstrings. Everybody stand up right now. Here's a real simple one you can do for the hips. Take your chair that you have in front of you or to the side of you, turn it so that the back of the chair is perpendicular to the table. Just like that. Now come right around to the front of the chair and put your knee on the chair. One knee is on the chair, one knee is on the ground. From there, the knee that is on the chair will just go a little forward. Feel the little stretch into the front of the hip. It's a very simple stretch. Doesn't require any major tools. It's a very easy stretch to do. And it's very safe, isn't it? Is anybody having any pain with that one? Not bad, no pain. Besides your normal agonizing emotional crisis pain that we all have, <laughs> right? Okay, good. But that's a real easy one to do. Let's take a look, go around to the back of the chair, right? Put your hands on the back of the chair so you have something sturdy. And then I'll just step out here a little bit. Put one leg back. Drop your weight into the back of the calf and then let your hip come just a little forward. Congratulations, you're doing a nice little easy calf stretch. And again, we can do this anywhere. And then we just switch, switch the legs. Should feel good to kind of move, doesn't it? I know I feel better. They had me locked behind this podium. Not used to that. It's hard. Come on back again. Good. Now here comes a fun one. Bring your chest nice and tall as best you can. Bring your arms out to the side, just like that. Come there, lift up, take a deep breath in. Extend, there you go. If you can get a little extension with the spine, go ahead and do so. And there, there you go. I'm one step away of creating a cult now. There it is, there it is. Yes, I've set you all up for that joke, because it's funny. All right, grab a seat, everybody. But this is what I mean by simple things. It doesn't have to be big, formulative, there. Simple motion, easy motion. It doesn't have to be anything that is rigorous in there. Because again, getting movement is the key. And getting any movement that you can within your availability is the key. So, postural correction maintenance here. Strengthening of the upper back muscles. Elasticity of the pectoral muscles. Did anybody not feel a little stretch with that one? Felt a little stretch right there. Excellent. And improving flexibility of the lumbar curve. Now, when we get into strengthening, land versus water, we talked a little bit about this. Obviously, we can do a little bit more in water because of the buoyancy of the water versus when we look at land, land we have gravity. We have a specific weight that we're dealing with. Sometimes that can be a little bit more to overcome. So the general rule here is with somebody that's in the later stages of AS is obviously no heavy weights because we don't want so much strain on the tissue. But light weights with high repetition can be functional and available for the individual, okay? Cardiovascular exercise, okay? Even though despite having restrictions in the chest wall and movement there, we can still maintain mobility into the thoracic spine, okay? We, create short-lived spinal flexibility with movement. Unfortunately, when we do stretches and we have some limitations in thoracic mobility or lumbar mobility there, it's kind of when you start over, you almost feel like you're starting over again. Yes, is the answer, okay? Because you're trying to maintain what you have. There is 
some gains that will be made, some people that don't have as much fusion will keep some of those gains at a little bit longer. Some people that have more fusion, you're just trying to maintain with the fusion what you have. So it is very, again, individualistic to the person. But again, overall, the more that you move, the better that we have. Now, if we go down here, regular aerobic exercise is safe for ankylosing spondylitis in patients without hip involvement. What we don't have is we're saying that we don't want high impact if we do have a lot of hip involvement, if we're seeing changes in the femoral head, if we're seeing necrosis or something of that nature there, or somebody's already gone and had to have joint replacement, total hip arthroscopy, okay? Because then it's gonna put more pressure in through the bone, more pressure through that, and that's just the normal thing that's there. So then we normally use 60% of the max heart rate for kind of a global measurement as far as intensity. Again, there is variation in that. It is not a one size fits all. So the last thing I want to leave you with, and it's probably the most important thing that we've talked about is breathing exercises, okay? This is practice at all stages, okay? It improves function, vital capacity, improves the mobility of the thoracic spine, improves the movement of the diaphragm, the abdominal and full rib cage expansion there. So I've got a picture here that shows exactly where the diaphragm is located when we're looking at it. Okay? When we talk about abdominal breathing, we're talking about the diaphragm. We're not talking where your belly button is. We're talking up here. So a lot of times when you see people trying to belly breathe, they're actually on their belly. That's not where your diaphragm lives. That's where the intestines are. Why do we know that? We have a picture that shows us. So we come up, follow the green bouncing diaphragm. Okay? Now, what is it? The diaphragm is a big musculotendinous structure it helps separate the two cavities of the body, okay? And we have the upper layer and the lower layer, which is the abdomen versus the lungs. So we're looking at the changes in diaphragmatic breathing. We want to come in through the nose so that we get a chance to warm the air versus the mouth, okay? You have little hairs in your nose. That's to help filter the air. And then we create a warm air which comes into the body easier, which is easier for expansion versus breathing straight through the mouth and cold air there. When we look at the mechanics of breathing, we're looking at both the diaphragm and the costal, i.e. the ribs, working together, okay? They are a joint unit, it's a joint venture. One of them relies on the other to get maximal expansion. So when we're seeing the, the movement changes, this is what physically happens. We can see the change of, when we inhale, the sternum rises, there's space between the intercostal motion and we can take a look at the contraction of the diaphragm, how it pushes down. Remember what I said earlier. When we breathe and we inhale, what do we see those ribs? They're almost horizontal, aren't they? They come up against gravity. But if we're slouched down forward, they can't achieve that same position. So it's harder to get air in. That's why the neck muscles have to work more. Those are those accessory muscles. From up down, we take a look, we can see the expansion of the rib cage from a superior inferior kind of view, we see where it goes in here. So remember, breathing is a three-dimensional thing. Front, back, left, right, up, down. All three dimensions working together. It's not more than one than the other. But if you have somebody that has a lot of decreased thoracic mobility, they can still get good diaphragmatic load because it still can go up and down. It's just gonna be harder to get some of that lateral wall movement, okay? And some of the goals that are here, and again, of what we're looking to do is make some of these changes that are there. Again, it's not an inclusive list, but again, it's a pretty thorough list of why do we do this here. So, real quick, let's practice. So, the most ideal position you can do diaphragmatic breathing is laying down. Because why? Those ribs, the ribs are what? They're not against gravity, they're with gravity. They're more horizontal. So we've got more motion, okay? I'm not gonna have you all lay down on the floor because I don't know if everybody can get back up, okay? So I don't have that kind of time today. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the one where the person's sitting in the chair, very simply. Now, if you do have some shortening of the thoracic and you do have some loss of that mobility, what you can do is slide back in to help change that angle a little bit, okay? We put one hand on the sternum, one hand right here on the diaphragm, and if you're wondering where your diaphragm is, it's real simple. Come right up into the middle, You'll feel another notch where the xiphoid process is. Put your thumb right there, put your hand right across it. 
So what you should feel is the sternum rise. This hand's gonna come out. Another cue you can use is put your hand on the lateral rib cage. You should feel lateral expansive that way of the costal rib tissue. And then we're just in through the nose and out. And then in, hold, and out. And if we keep doing this, you'll all be asleep in about five minutes. But unfortunately for you, I have to finish up and I can't have you all falling asleep just yet. So remember, the goal is to store, restore optimal function. That's our goal. And what's the one thing we've learned today? Motion is lotion. Motion is lotion. So I want to thank you all for your attention and feel free to follow the science. <laughs>